Chapter Eleven of Jetta of the Lowlands by Ray Cummings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Aboard the Bandit Flyer, I was dimly conscious of being inside the cubby of the car, with bandits sitting over me. The car was rolling through the village streets, ascending. We must be heading for Spawn's mine. I thought of Jetta. Then I heard her voice and felt her stir beside me. The roaring in my head made everything dreamlike. I sank half into unconsciousness again. It seemed an endless interval, with only the muttering hiss of the car's mechanism and the confused murmurs of the bandits' voices. Then my strength came. The cold sweat on me was drying in the night breeze that swept through the car as it climbed the winding ascent. I could see through its side oval a vista of bloated lowland crags with moonlight on them. It seemed that we should be nearly to the mine. We stopped. The men in the car began climbing out. De Beer's voice. Is he conscious now? I'll take the girl. Someone bent over me. You hear me? Yes, I said. I found myself outside the car. They held me on my feet. Someone gratuitously cuffed me, but De Beer's voice issued a sharp, low-toned rebuke. Stop it. Get him and the girl aboard. There seemed thirty or forty men gathered here, silent dark figures in black robes. The moonlight showed them, and occasionally one flashed a hand search beam. It was De Beer's main party gathered to attack the mine. I stood wavering on my feet. I was still weak and dizzy, with a lump on the back of my head where I had been struck. The scene about me was at first unfamiliar. We were in a rocky gully, rounded broken walls, caves and crevices, dried ooze piled like a ramp up one side. The moonlight struggled down through a gathering mist overhead. I saw presently where we were, above the mine, not below it, and I realized that the car had encircled the mine's cauldron and climbed to a height beyond it. Down the small gully, I could see where it opened into the cauldron, about a hundred feet below us. The lights of the mine winked in the blurred moonlight shadows. The bandits led me up the gully. The car was left standing against the gully side, where it had halted. De Beer, or one of his men, was carrying Jetta. The flyer was here. We came upon it suddenly, around a bend in the gully. Although I had only seen the nose of it earlier in the evening, I recognized this to be the same. It was in truth a strange-looking flyer. I had never seen one quite like it. Barrel winged like a Janston, multi-propellered, and with folding helicopters for the vertical lifts and descents. And a great spreading fan tail, in the British fashion. It rested on the rocks like a fat-winged bird, with its long cylindrical body puffed out underneath. A seventy-foot cabin, fifteen feet wide, possibly. A line of small window ports a circular glassite front to the forward control observatory cubby. With her propellers just above it and the pilot cubby up there behind them. And underneath the hole, a landing gear of the Fraser Mood springed cushion type and an expanding air coil pontoon bladder for landing upon water. All this was usual enough, yet with the brief glimpse I had as my captors hurried me toward the landing incline, I was aware of something very strange about this flyer. It was all dead black, a bloated, bellied blackbird. The moonlight struck it, but did not gleam or shimmer on its black metal surface. The cabin window ports glowed with a dim, blue-gray light from inside. But as I chanced to gaze at one, a green film seemed to cross it like a shade so that it winked and its light was gone. Yet a hole was there, like an eye socket, an empty green hole. We were close to the plain now, approaching the bottom 
of the small landing incline. The wing over my head was like a huge fat barrel cut lengthwise in half. I stared up, and suddenly it seemed that the wing was melting, fading. Its inner portion, where it joined the body, was clear in the moonlight, but the tips blurred and faded. An aspect curiously leprous, uncanny, gruesome. They took me up the landing incline. A narrow vaulted corridor ran lengthwise of the interior, along one side of the cabin body. To my left, as we headed for the bow control room, the corridor window ports showed the rocks outside. To the right of the corridor, the ship's small rooms lay in a string. A metal interior, I saw, almost nothing save metal in various forms. Grid floor and ceiling, sheet metal walls and partitions, furnishings and fabrics, all of spun metal, all dead black. We entered the control room. Two men holding me flung me in a chair. I had been searched. They had taken from me the tiny, colored magnesium light flashes. How easy for the plans of men to go astray. Hanley and I had arranged that I was to signal the Puerto Rican patrol ship with those flares. Sit quiet, commanded my guard. I retorted, if you hit me again, I won't. The beer came in, carrying Jetta. He put her in a chair near me, and she sat huddled, tense. In the dim gray light of the control room, her white face, with its big, staring dark eyes, was turned toward me. But she did not speak, nor did I. The bandits ignored us. De Beer moved about the room, examining a bank of instruments. Familiar instruments, most of them. The usual aero controls and navigation devices. A radio autophone transmitter and receiver, with its attendant eavesdropping cutoffs. And there was an ether wave mirror grid. De Beer bent over it. And then I saw him fastening upon his forehead an image lens. He said, You stay here, Hans, you and Gutierrez. Take care of the girl and this fellow Grant. Don't hurt them. Gutierrez was a swarthy Latin American. He smiled. For why would I hurt him? You say is worth much money to us, De Beer. And the girl? Ah. De Beer towered over him. Just lay a finger on her and you will regret it, Gutierrez. You stay at your controls. Be ready. This affair, it will take no more than half an hour. A man came to the control room entrance. You come, Commander. Yes, right at once. The men are ready. From the mine, we might almost be seen here. This delay? Coming, Roush. But he lingered a moment more. Hans, my finder, will show you what I do. Keep watch. When we come back, have all ready for flight. This Grant had an alarm detector. Heaven only knows what eavesdropping and relaying he has done. And for sure, there is hell now in Spawn's garden. The Narita police are there, of course. They might track us up here. He paused before me. I think I would not cause trouble, Grant. I'm not a fool. Perhaps not. He turned to Jetta. No harm will come to you. Fear nothing. He wound his dark cloak about his giant figure and left the control room. In a moment, through the rounded, observing pane beside me, I saw him outside on the moonlit rocks. His men gathered about him. There were forty of them, possibly, with ten or so left here aboard to guard the flyer. And in another moment, the group of dark-cloaked figures outside crept off in single file like a slithering serpent, moving down the rock defile toward where in the cauldron pit the lights of the mine shone on its dark, silent buildings. End of chapter 11